Hi, and welcome to Tom Kennedy Science, and I'm your host, Dr. Tom Kennedy. So in this lecture, once again, we're continuing on with plant form and function. And now I'm gonna talk about plant growth. And if you watch my previous lecture, we learned about how the plants are organized into different tissues and organs, and how those cells that differentiate into the different tissues and organs come from a meristem. And those meristems, of course, are important for plant growth because plants grow up tall. That's primary growth. You've seen a stick elongate, right? You've watched a plant grow. As it elongates, it's longer and longer and longer. That's primary growth. And then secondary growth is we're like watching a tree get thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker. So growth depends on our meristems. And like I said, the apical meristem is at the tip of a shoot or a root. And then you have what is called a lateral meristem, which is on the inside of the plant, and that's responsible for secondary growth. Let's take a closer look. So our apical meristems, like I said, these are on the, on the tips of our shoots and our roots, and they're important for elongating. And as they divide through mitosis, this is asexual reproduction, they give rise to the different types of tissues, right? Remember, protoderm, cambium, you got it, ground meristems. And then these cells will differentiate into the actual tissues and organs that make up the plant. So let's begin with primary growth. We're just gonna increase the length of a root or a shoot. Now, we know this. The apical meristems give rise to three different populations of our primary meristem. Protoderm gives rise to dermal tissue. Ground meristem gives rise to the ground tissue. And then the procambium gives rise to the vascular tissue. Now, if you're like me, every now and then I might slip up and say procambrium, but I'm so used to saying the Cambrian explosion and things like that. I'm used to putting an R in there. There's no R, it's just cambium. Now, let's take a look at one of the most widely seen images in plant textbooks. Whoever took this photo, it's used everywhere. But this shows primary growth from a stem, okay? So at the very tip of it, you've got your apical meristem. It's growing and dividing by mitosis and giving rise to our three different types of meristematic tissue. You've got the newly forming leaves, you've got the ground meristem, and then you've got the um, cambium, which is going to differentiate into both the xylem and the phloem. And of course, the same thing is happening at the roots. Now you'll notice the tip of that root, there's all those really thick cells, right? So it can force its way through the soil. But once again, it's got a procambium layer that's going to become the, the vascular tissue, the xylem and the phloem. It's also got the protoderm, which will turn into like the root hairs and the epidermis lining the plant root. And then the ground meristem, which is the internal part of the plant that will turn into pith or it might become a tuber to store carbohydrates or something. So when you got a root and it's growing, you have this zone of cellular division. That's just where mitosis is taking place. That's where this thing is growing and adding cells and they're differentiating. Now this increase in length, like I said, we're not increasing thickness at all. We're just increasing length. And then as this root ages, you've got the zone of maturation. That's where your cellular differentiation is occurring. That's where you're actually having your procambium is turning into companion cells or C2 elements. But then eventually, you'll start to grow root hairs from the epidermis. And that, like I said, those are very important for increasing surface area. So you can increase your absorption of water and minerals. And then the same thing happens with your, your tips of your shoots as well. But let's talk about secondary growth. You know, you're growing up, if you're growing taller and taller and taller, and you do this over many years, you gotta have a larger base. So let's talk about how trees grow thick. Once again, you've got a meristem. It divides into your protoderm, your ground meristem, and your procambium. Now, you get your shoot apical meristem and your root apical meristem. That's just your elongation. Now, when we get to secondary growth, instead of growing long, we're growing out wide, we now have a lateral meristem forming the cambium, okay? Now, it's called lateral. So if you imagine you've got a tree, 
Inside the bark, you've got this cylindrical cambium layer. It's a meristem, it's a lateral meristem. These are your stem cells. They grow and divide. Now there's two types of these cambiums, the vascular cambium and the cork cambium. Vascular cambium, vascular, xylem and phloem. What could this be forming? And then the cork cambium. So the cork cambium is on the outermost layer. It's right behind your bark. You ever seen like a pine tree? You ever notice a bark flakes right off? Or you've seen bark flaking off another tree? Yeah, that's the cork cambium producing that bark. And it grows it on one side, which forms your bark. And as a plant grows, it's constantly replacing the bark. The bark is constantly coming off. So now inside of that, we have the vascular cambium. And it's producing phloem and xylem. Okay, now phloem. The companion cells in phloem are always alive at maturity. They have to be because they're doing active transport. They're loading the sieve tube elements with metabolites so it can move around. So phloem always has to be alive. Now xylem is a passive process. If you're passive, you don't have to be alive. So a lot of the secondary xylem that's produced on the inside of your vascular cambium is not necessarily alive at maturity. Okay, so as a tree, you can imagine you've got your vascular cambium. As you continually add secondary xylem, because it's made second, right? It gets thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker. And you constantly replace your phloem because it needs to be alive. So you can see year one, year two, year three. And over the years, you build up secondary xylem. And remember, secondary xylem has all of these sclerenchyma cells. They're adding lots of cellulose, very thick cell walls. They're lignified. They're very tough. And then eventually, what will happen is those xylem cells will become filled up with stuff, and they'll no longer be conducting water throughout the tree. Okay, so there it is, our lateral meristem. It's forming the vascular cambium, secondary xylem, and phloem. So as I was saying, the secondary xylem, this is what makes up wood. I always use a two by four as an example, but it's what makes up wood. And it's the secondary phloem that makes up the inner part of the bark of the tree. And the cork cambium produces the cork cells and the cork cells plus the secondary phloem, that equals, that equals the bark. Now, you may notice that on this piece of wood that the center part is darker. That's called the heartwood. And you can find this in a pine tree and it smells pretty good too if you've, ever, if you've ever smelled heartwood pine. That's because it's full of all kinds of chemicals that are protecting it. And these cells, of course, they're dead at maturity, but they're also not conducting water anymore. And then the sapwood, the stuff that's actually active, well, it's lighter in color. Now, if you notice, trees around here in North America have rings. You have tree rings which is kind of interesting. Now what those tree rings are, are, basically, they're basically formed when you have a growing season and a non-growing season. So during the growing season, the vascular cambium, I mean, is growing quickly, right? And it's adding these larger cells with thinner walls. Now, as the growing season comes to an end, the cells are smaller with thicker cells. So, when you're rapidly growing thin cells, the ring appears light. And then as you approach the non-growing season, the cells are much smaller, much thicker, and they're dark. And that forms a tree ring. Now tree rings, I'm gonna go off on a little bit of a tangent here because we can use them to study climate. And in fact, there's an entire field of study called dendrochronology, where you can go pull tree rings and start to understand the patterns of rainfall and climate in your region. And this is very good. You know, people haven't always had thermometers in the West for the last few hundreds of years. I mean, we've had them about a hundred, but we don't have them going back several hundred years. So we can use tree rings as proxy data. We call it proxy because I'm not actually taking the temperature with a thermometer. I'm reconstructing our past climate of rainfall and temperature using other data besides a direct measurement. 
And of course we can use tree rings to do this. And this leads to some incredibly famous publications. One came out in 1999 when Dr. Michael Mann, he was using tree ring data from the Northern Hemisphere to reconstruct the climate going back about a thousand years. One of the questions he was interested in was, was there a medieval warming period in the Southwest and other areas that may have led to people leaving this area? And can we also see like maybe a little miniature ice age when temperatures got cooler? So he reconstructed the past using this proxy data, using thousands of tree core samples. And this is what he came up with. This is the hockey stick graph. There's a couple interesting things about this. For one, it reconstructs a Northern Hemisphere climate going back almost a thousand years, long before we had lots of thermometers. Secondly, you notice that straight line. That straight line is the average climate from 1960 to 1990. My dog's down here trying to nuzzle me. He wants some attention. And you should notice that the average temperature fluctuated over the last thousand years. It went up and down a little bit, but it was below the 1960 to 1990 average. Now, when he went to go publish this finding, a reviewer said, why don't you add in the data from the last hundred years? Add in the, therm the thermometer data, the actual temperature data. And what they found was that, you know, there's this, you know, kind of like this, this is the hockey stick. And then you've got the area where you hit the puck where it rapidly increases. What this shows is that in the last hundred years, climate, the average or the average temperatures in Northern hemisphere have rapidly risen well above anything we've seen for the last thousand years. So this is one of the first like wow moments of how rapidly we are changing our climate. Not surprisingly, there's climate deniers out there, people that don't believe in climate change, and this is complicated. There's a lot of reasons why people don't accept it. One is they just don't know. They just haven't been educated on it. Uh, a lot of it is having to do with who you identify with. But, you know, science tells us a story. Data tells us a story. We call this the hockey stick model and uh, because it looks like a hockey stick. And I actually added in a red line to show where we're at in the last 20 years, where we've gone up even more since this was published. This also brings up some problems when science goes against what people want to believe or it causes problems for very large industries. This model of climate change has been heavily criticized by people that don't want to believe in climate change, like I said, for various reasons. I mean, they went so far as to hack Dr. Mann's email and pull statements out of context, trying to get him framed for saying that he massaged the data and made this up. Well, you know, one of the best things about science, it's repeatable. If I go out and do an experiment and I publish how I did it, you should be able to go out and get similar results. Well, the scientific community came to Michael Mann's rescue. Multiple labs, after he was hacked and like basically like ridiculed for trying for making up the data, multiple labs went out using his methodology and reconstructed the exact same thing he found. The science was repeatable. Not only did they reconstruct what he found for the last thousand years, they did a reconstruction, pushing it back over 2000 years. They added in additional proxy data. So that's an important point. He didn't make the data up, but yet people try to pin him for that. But that's a beautiful thing about science. It is what it is. The data is there, right? If I can find it, you can find it. Okay, well, that's it for plants on their secondary and primary growth and how we can actually use secondary growth to reconstruct climates and how we can use that to show that we are causing rapid climate change on our planet today. Okay, until next time, it's Tom Kennedy Science.